Welcome to Code Station 33. Today we are going to look at if statements and how does that work to help the computer make a decision using logic. We're going to use that to write a program that is going to allow us to press a button to turn an LED on and then press the same button and it will turn the LED off. It's a toggle switch. So let's get started. So this is still part of unit three, decision making and using logic. And we're going to look at first logic in a computer. Now a computer can either be true or false when we're talking about logic. It's a switch. It's either on or off, much like our toggle switch we're going to build. So it's a great example. The not statement is really important to understand when we're talking about logic. So we understand what does a true mean versus a false. So let me give you an example. If I say it's raining outside, that would be a true statement if I was looking outside and there was rain coming down. What's the opposite of that? What is the opposite condition of it's raining outside? It's not raining. That's the opposite condition of it, it's raining outside, would be it's not raining. Here's another example. If I'm comparing the value of x to the value of 5 and I say, is x greater than 5? Is the variable x, what's stored in x, is it greater than 5? So that would be true if x was like 15. But when is it false? Well, the opposite of x is greater than 5 is x is less than or equal to 5. It could be less than 5 or it could be equal to 5. So understanding what does a false statement really mean is important in our logic. In our language here of Arduino, the way we write a conditional, a test, an if-then statement, is we use the if command and then we put our condition in parentheses like x is less than 5 or x equals 10. So if x is less than 5, then we're going to do everything that's between these two curly brackets. Now if we only have one statement, we don't need the curly brackets. We need the statement, um, if we have multiple statements, we need to use the curly brackets. So our Arduino language knows that we have multiple statements and not just one. A really cool thing that we can do to increase the power of our conditional is to put in what's called a nested conditional. That's where one condition is inside another condition. So if we look at this, we have our first condition, and just like we saw before, and if it's true, if that condition is true, like x is less than 5, then it's going to execute any of the statements but that are between these curly brackets. So anything within that scope. It turns out in this scope we also have some other conditions. So if condition is tr 2 is true, then we're going to execute that statement. Then we might execute another statement. If condition is 3 is true, then we're going to execute that statement. Then we might execute another statement. We could do any combination of conditionals and additional statements that we would like. In fact, this nested conditional could have another conditional inside of that. We could go to as many levels as we want and the computer memory can handle. So this becomes a really, really powerful structure. But sometimes it becomes a little confusing. So we have another operator that we'll look at in the next lesson called a switch statement. So let's dive into our code for our toggle switch. The first thing we're going to do is set up some global definitions. We're going to set our LED pin to pin 3, so we remember that when we're building our circuit. We're going to set our pin button to pin 2. And then we have these extra variables down here that we're going to need. The first one is called toggle state. Now notice, we're not assigning it a value. That's really important. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Then we have last button state, which are going to keep track of whether or not our button was pressed or unpressed in the last state, 
the last time the button was pressed, that's going to be important, so we know when our button should toggle back and forth. Long unsigned int last press. Well, that's kind of important for us to keep track of, but what is this long unsigned int? We'll take a look at that. And then finally, the last one is the debounce time, and that's set to 20. So we're going to look at what does debounce mean in this whole thing, and we'll look at that in a couple of minutes when we get deeper into the code. So let's start first with declare versus declare initialize. When we declare a variable like int x in our first line here, if it's declared within our global variable at the file level at the top, then it's automatically initialized in Arduino to zero. Now this is special for the Arduino language. Other languages will not do this. Other languages require you to initialize it. So we'd have to do another step like x equals 20. That would initialize our variable to a value. So it can be done in two different statements, but the Arduino special treatment is that if it's done inside the global scope, then it's set to a zero. If it's done inside the local scope, then you have to initialize it. Otherwise, you're going to get a um, declare without initialize error. We could also do this in one step, like we saw in some of the other global declarations. Int y is equal to, is assigned the value of 10, and that is declaring it and initializing it at the same time. Let's talk about the long unsigned int, and this really has to do with space. See, in math, we have an infinite number of numbers. We can keep counting forever and ever and ever and never get to the end. However, a computer has limits on space and can't store an infinite size number. So we have to tell the computer how big of a box it should be setting up in our window so we can store that number. So let's talk about size. First, int. It is four bytes long. That is a four digit binary number and the largest number that we can store is this number here negative and positive so it's about two negative two billion positive two billion the unsigned int switches that so we get rid of all of the negatives so we're at this number here, four bytes still. The long int gives us eight bytes, which gives us a much larger space, twice as much space. But in terms of binary numbers, it actually gives us a much bigger number. And we go again from negative to positive. The unsigned long int is eight bytes and eliminates the negatives so we get twice as many positives. So we're gonna go from zero to that number. So that number is really important. Remember that is the largest long unsigned int that we're gonna be using in our lesson. Our pin modes are set up, we've seen this before. We're going to set the LED pin to output. We're going to set the button pin to input pull up. Remember, the input pull up keeps our pin button from getting interference from other voltages and end up giving us a value that we don't expect. Now into our code. There's a lot of things in here. First, we know this is a loop, so it's going to repeat over and over and over again. Then, we're looking at the first line of code, which is the button state. So this is gonna determine whether or not our button is pressed or not pressed. That gets us to debounce time. Our buttons are mechanical. So when we press them, there's actually a little bit of a bounce to them where the computer could read a couple times pressed on and off. Even though it feels like to us we only pressed it once, it's so fast. The computer reads this so fast and there could be a tiny little bounce in that button mechanically that the computer could read that as button presses, multiple button presses when we only pressed it once. 
to make sure we can eliminate that multiple press bounce, we say that a button press has to last more than 20 milliseconds to be registered as a button press. If it doesn't last more than 20 milliseconds, then it's not going to be a button press. Those bounces occur somewhere in the range of about 5 milliseconds. So it happens super, super fast. So if we are just looking at things that are greater than 20, then that deep, that button press um, bounce will be ignored. So let's talk about how do we go ahead and calculate that. What's this operator here? So our conditional, if mils minus last press is greater than debounce time. Well, debounce time we know is 20 milliseconds, but let's talk about this operation going on here. Last press we know is zero. So we're going to take some kind of mils, whatever that is, minus zero and see if that is greater than debounce time. So let's go and dive in a little bit. Let's talk about mils. Well, mils returns the number of milliseconds that has passed since the Arduino board first got power. And then after 50 days, it resets back to zero. If you do the math on that, 50 days is about uh, 4,320,000,000 milliseconds. Now, remember, we said that an unsigned long can hold a value of 4,294,967,295 different values. So that's why it's approximately 50 days. It's not quite 50 days. It's a little shy of 50 days, and then it resets to zero. Basically, when it gets to that number, which is the biggest number it can store, that's when it flips back down to zero. And what we're going to do is keep track of that as a time value. It's some kind of number in milliseconds, and that's going to be our time. So when we dive back into our code here, this is the amount of milliseconds that has been since we plugged in the board. And if that number minus the last time we pressed is greater than 20 milliseconds, then we're going to record that as a bounce. So that would be true in the first initial case. We plug in the board. As long as the board's been powered for more than 20 milliseconds, we're going to count that as a press because the last press was a zero. So any amount of time bigger than 20 milliseconds is going to be bigger than 20 milliseconds. We're going to count that as a press. Now, notice this next line here is really important. We're going to know, let's say 100 milliseconds has passed. 100 minus 20 is going to be 80. So that's bigger than 20. But now we're going to set the last press to 100 milliseconds in this line right here. Last press equals mils. That means if there's a bounce, let's say at 103 milliseconds, after all this code is looked at, because this happens really, really fast, then 103 minus 100 is only going to be 3 milliseconds, which is not bigger than debounce time, and then all of this code will be ignored. So we've taken care of that little bounce by this condition here and by this statement here. That's the purpose of this first conditional, to let us know that this is a button press that we want to count. So now we've determined that a button has been pressed. It's true, a button has been pressed. We need to decide what to do with that button. Well, if we're holding down the button, then it's going to keep sending the value that the button is being held down. So the button state is going to be pressed a 1. So we don't want to always have the button state to stay a 1. We want to make this a toggle. So if we press the button, it's just going to say, yeah, the button was pressed, and then that's it. It won't flip back and forth. It won't do anything else. So we need to actually keep track of two different values. So if the button state was 0, which means the last time it was pressed, excuse me, this time that it's pressed is unpressed, so our finger's not on it, and the last button state was a 1. That means the last time the button state read a value, it was pressed. So if right now we're not pressing it, and last time we were pressing it, then we're going to say, oh, this was a press and was released last changed. So the button was pressed and released in the last change. That's what this conditional is going to do. The ampersand ampersand. 
Oh, let me go back to that. We'll come back to that in a second. I missed something I wanted to talk about here. The equals equals symbol. Equals versus equals equals. This equals symbol in math means to assign a value. In computer science, we make that different because in computer science, it only means to assign a value. In algebra, it means to assign a value, but it also means to compare values. We use the same symbol to mean two different things in math because we really don't care about the difference between assigning a value and comparing a value. In computer science, that's a big deal. Assigning a value is an equal sign, but to let the computer know that we want to compare two values, we use an equals equals. That tells us for sure that we are comparing two values not just assigning a value. So when we um, also look at our ampersand, that ampersand, ampersand, that means an and, which means both conditions must be true. Our and symbol means both conditions need to be true in order for that whole conditional to be true. So let's jump back into that code. And we see that we are testing to see if the button state is equal to zero and the last button state is equal to 1. So we are comparing button state with 0 and the last button state with 1. If both those things are true, then we're going to do this code here. If one of those things is false, then we're not going to do this code. We're going to totally ignore it. That gets us down to this statement. Toggle state equals exclamation mark toggle state. What does that mean? Well, it's using what we call the not operator. The exclamation mark is the not operator. And it's not the value of the toggle state is assigned to toggle state, which means we flip the condition. Remember we talked about that in the very beginning, flipping what a condition means from one thing to another. In terms of toggle state, I know it's declared as an int, but in this language, if it's declared as an int and no initialization is made, or it's initialized to a value of zero, then it's going to behave as a Boolean true or false, just a one or a zero value. And that's it. As long as we don't change anywhere else in the code the value to something other than one or a zero, then it will still behave as a Boolean true or false. So essentially what we're saying here, toggle state is equal to the opposite of what it was. So if it's a one, it's going to become a zero. If it's a zero, it's going to become a one. So this is what's keeping track of whether or not the, the button was pressed to turn on the LED or the button was pressed to turn off the LED. Let's go back to our code. We're going to digital write the toggle state to the LED. So that's going to turn the LED on or tell the LED off. And then we're going to say the last button state was zero. So we're recording the last button state as zero. Next thing. If the button state last was a one and the last button state was a zero, in other words, if the button state is a one, it's pressed, and the last button state is a zero, that means we need to flip the last button state to one. So if the button is not pressed and was pressed in the last change, we're now going to flip it to a one. So this is going to make our button work as a toggle, turning on and off. Take a little bit of time and look at this code and kind of sit with that. I know it's a little complex when you first start, but if you sit with it and think about it and kind of ponder around, maybe play with the idea of thinking about a button going on and off, maybe when we run the code, you can kind of imagine us pressing the button and what effect that has on the light as we go through each time, it'll help you understand what is actually going on here in this code and understand a little bit better about how we're using our toggle state and why we are setting our last button state to keep track of when our button was pressed previously or unpressed previously. We gotta wire up our code for our circuit. So when we go ahead into Tinkercad or you're doing this for real, you're going to have our ground attached to our ground wire on our board, the G and D. And we're going to just use this grounding bar to ground everything. You can see we ground the LED with the cathode, which is the shorter side on the left. And we're going to ground the button, which is on the right leg 
of our button. Then we're going to take our data pins. Uh, pin 3 is going to go to our resistor. Remember, we want a resistor there so we don't burn out the LED. And that's going to go to the anode of our LED. And then we're going to take the positive side of our button and go to pin 2 on our board. Just like we set up in code, we set the LED pin to 3 and we set the button pin to 2. Please make sure that your code matches your circuit. If it doesn't, things are not going to work properly. One last thing, the if-else statement. I'm going to talk about this briefly, and we're going to dive into it more later on. The if-else statement allows us to do something different. If a condition is true, we want to do a whole bunch of statements. But what if it's not true? What's the opposite of that statement? If the opposite is true, then we're going to do a different set of statements. So right now, our if statement by itself, if the condition is true, do these statements. If the condition is not true, don't do anything. The else, which I'll look at in code later, gives us the ability to say, hey, if the condition is true, do these statements. Otherwise, do this. So for example, if it's raining outside, then I need an umbrella. So I should bring an umbrella if it's raining outside. Otherwise, don't bring the umbrella. So if it's raining outside, bring the umbrella. Else, don't bring the umbrella. That is our lesson for today. Enjoy making the project, and I will see you next time.